So tonight's program on does addiction treatment work will be presented by Dr. Carl Christensen. Dr. Christensen currently works with recovery specialists at St. Joe's, specializing in helping patients discontinue opioid use, and with the Packard Health Clinic, working with patients who have substance use disorders. He's a clinical associate professor at Wayne State University in the departments of psychiatry and OBGYN, and he's the medical director of Don Farm and the Michigan Health Professional Recovery Program. He is a past president of the Michigan Society of Addiction Medicine and is a distinguished fellow in the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Dr. Christensen currently works with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the DEA, and local law enforcement as an expert witness for opioid prescribing cases. He has received numerous teaching awards and has been named one of the top docs in the addiction medicine in our magazine for 2006 through 2018. Please join me in welcoming Carl Christensen. All right, first thing is uh, we always have to have disclaimers. I have no financial relationships to disclose. I'm on the faculty at Wayne State's Medical School in Psychiatry and OB, work here at St. Joe's, um, and I'm also, like I said, an expert witness for the DEA. And one of the most important things I work with is Families Against Narcotics. I'm on the advisory board for the Western Wayne chapter, and we now have a Washtenaw County chapter, and if there's anybody in your family it's been affected by addiction, I would urge you to come to one of our meetings. You can find everything online. And um, I need to do informed consent, kind of like before surgery with this talk. Um, I've been giving this talk here at St. Joe's for years and years, and a few years ago we started getting feedback from the audience, and I expect it to be 100% good. And this is one of the first comments I got. And so I went home and I, I rewrote the talk and I put in all this extra stuff and came back and knew that the comments would be great and this is what I got. So, um, and this year somebody already put uh, feedback in something about a please find a, mo a more coherent speaker in the future. So we'll see how it goes. So I also urge everyone to um, find this blog. You can get it on the internet. It's from Jason Swartz from Don Farm. He does addiction and recovery news and he is better than anybody I know at taking an article uh, that discusses the cure for addiction and uh, picking it apart. And when they, he's usually done, there's not much left. So if you want to see an unbiased view um, of articles, uh, you know, follow him and you can sign up and you'll get his blog every couple of weeks. So the first thing is, and everybody's been through this, we have to decide what addiction is. And you'd be amazed at how many different definitions you get. Um, even in people who do it for a living. And the most common one is that it's physical, meaning that if I take Norco for long enough, I'll get used to it. If I stop taking Norco, I'll get sick, and that's all there is to it. And all I have to do is get over being sick. Or I'm a weak-willed person. Or I'm a bad person. Or it's a real mental illness. And we're going to look at these uh, very, very quickly and talk more about it later. So the first one is that it's physical, meaning I have tolerance and withdrawal. And these two things are both sides of the same coin. Tolerance means that if I take the same amount of alcohol, benzos, opiates, whatever, eventually I'll become used to it, my body will push back, and I'll become tolerant and get less benefit. And then when I stop taking it, um, for whatever reason, I get the opposite effect of what the drug is supposed to do. So when I stop drinking, I get jittery and shaky, or ta stop taking benzos or whatever. And neither one of these defines addiction. And this is probably a different audience than most, but you can normally take an audience of people and force feed everybody morphine for two weeks and then suddenly stop and everybody will get sick, but only about 15% of the audience will go out and keep on practicing addiction because we've triggered the, the disease of addiction in them. And depending upon what population you're talking about, it's somewhere around 15% of the population is at risk for getting addiction, and about 3% of us are actively addicted at any one time. You can say that addicts don't have willpower. Now, I've tried to mix up Republicans and Democrats here, but <laughs> if you look on the left, the two on the left were alleged to be amphetamine addicts. The two on the right were alleged to be alcoholics. And you can say what you want about any of these gentlemen, but no one has really accused any of them of being weak-willed. And history is full of strong-willed alcoholics and addicts. It really doesn't add up. 
You can say that addicts are bad people. Now, everybody knows the guy on their right because of the cigar. Sigmund Freud was a cocaine addict. He became addicted to cocaine when he tried to treat his own tobacco addiction. He got facial cancer, and he used to whittle away at himself after numbing himself up with cocaine. Didn't work. The guy on the left is William Halstead. William Halstead is considered to be the greatest teacher of cancer surgery that ever lived, and in a former life I was a cancer surgeon, and this guy was God, okay? He was also a bad cocaine addict, and not only was he addicted, but his fellows and his colleagues got addicted, and you can only imagine what rounds were like with him in the morning. <laughs> Neither of these guys ever got clean. I think Halstead managed to switch over to morphine before the end, and he found that didn't go too well either. But these are not considered to be bad people. These are people who got addicted to cocaine because they were told it was a good thing, and that's what you'll find in the books back then. So we're left with talking about this as a mental illness, and that's what we're going to focus on. And I'm going to show you a picture of a rat brain, and over on your right is the frontal cortex, and in the back is the hindbrain, and the demon here is where that purple arrow is. That's a location called the nucleus accumbens. And that is the part of your brain that responds to the pleasure drug, which is known as dopamine. And dopamine causes both craving and reward. So when you walk past a bar, a dope house, a pastry shop, whatever it is, and you get that urge to do something about it, that's dopamine. And when you do it and you feel that reward, that's dopamine again. And the gas tank for dopamine is right behind the nucleus accumbens. It's called the ventral tegmental area. And if you look at the list over on the right and the bottom, all the drugs of abuse that we talk about, either directly or indirectly, feed into the nucleus accumbens by causing craving and causing reward. And another area is the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that is supposed to put on the brakes. I'm going to sit down for a sec. So those of you who go to a bar tonight and have one or two beers and say, I don't want to get arrested on the way home, I'm going to leave, that's your prefrontal cortex telling your nucleus accumbens to stop. And that's how it normally works. You control any impulses. In addiction, I'm going to show you how these areas of your brain are broken. This is a normal brain. Imagine yourself looking down at somebody's head and their cortex, the front, is pointing up, and they have a left side and a right side, and what you're looking at, that yellow and red area, is their nucleus accumbens. That's their pleasure center. And the red you see is dopamine. And this is what a normal, happy, healthy brain is supposed to look like. And this is a research study done by Dr. Nora Volkov, who's the, national, the medical director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and she took three normal, happy controls, and you can see their brains on the left-hand side. That's how you're supposed to look. And then she took a cocaine addict, an alcoholic, and a heroin addict, and took pictures of their brains. And you can see they all share one thing. They're, they've run out of dopamine. And even though it's different drugs, it's a common pathway. And that's one theory of addiction. It's called the reward deficiency syndrome, that addicts and alcoholics run out of dopamine, they feel terrible, and they spend all their time trying to catch back up by doing things that give you a lot of dopamine. So instead of watching TV, they use heroin. And it sounds ridiculous, but that gives you a bigger burst of dopamine than any natural activity will. Everybody stops. You go to jail, you go to treatment, you run out of money, you get caught, you get intervened on. But most people with addiction don't stay stopped. They use again, okay? So why does that happen? Because if you get past a few days, even for most drugs, the withdrawal is gone. So why would somebody go through all that misery of withdrawal and then go back out and use again? Here's why, okay? Now we're looking at your brain, cortical brain metabolism. And this is a normal brain on your left, and the cortex, you, is pointing up, and all that orange and red you see is brain metabolism. It's actually your brain uses glucose. It doesn't use anything else. So that's how a brain is supposed to look. Over on the right, we have an active cocaine addict. And you can see how little there is going on in that brain. And that means that there is no judgment, there is no impulse control, there is no forward thinking, and anybody who's worked with someone with active addiction has 
experience that firsthand. Now you can say that this is just short term and it's not a problem, but it turns out that's not the case. This is a study done by Dr. Mark Gold and the University of Florida and what he did was he paid three cocaine addicts to stay in the hospital for 100 days. And they actually drug tested them every day to make sure they didn't sneak out and use. And then he took pictures of their brains at 10 days and 100 days. He started off with volunteers at the top who are normal. And that's how your brain is supposed to look. That yellow and red you're seeing is normal brain metabolism. And your frontal cortex is pointing up. And then he took our three cocaine addicts who've been in the hospital for 10 days and took pictures of their brain and look at the difference. There's no brain activity. It looks like someone pulled the plug out of the machine. Now you can say, well, so what? That's only 10 days. And I will respond, well, yes, but that's more treatment than you are going to get in the state of Michigan right now with your Blue Cross insurance. You're going to go someplace for about seven days. They're going to keep you in. They're going to turn you loose when your insurance runs out because they have to. And they're going to give you a big book and a list of meetings and you're going to use on the way home. And that happens every day. The reason is because if you look at the same people 100 days out, their brains are still a mess. Compare the top with the bottom row. This is when you have got your 90-day chip. You're supposed to be sponsoring people. You're supposed to be back at work. And I mentioned I was the medical director for the Impaired Doctors Program in Michigan. If you're a cocaine-addicted surgeon, this is when we let you go back to work. So if anybody's having surgery next week, just stop by and I'll tell you whether or not the name is safe. <laughs> now there's a lot of talk about how we are creating a disease that doesn't exist. And people say, well, all this is is evidence of brain damage. You use drugs, you damage your brain, you run out of dopamine. So is there anything to say that this happens before your addiction is active? And here's a study they did out in California. They took people who were not using drugs, not addicted, and did brain scans on them and looked at their dopamine levels. And then they give them IV Ritalin, which is methylphenidate. It's the same thing as one of your patients doing methamphetamine IV. And they asked them, did you like that? And most of them said, hell no, that was a horrible experience, which about 85% of us would say that's the normal reaction. About 15% of us would say they liked it. Even though we're not addicted, we're not using drugs, we would say that wasn't bad. And it turns out the people who enjoyed it were already walking around with lower levels of dopamine. <laughs> they were either born that way or something happened to them to cause their dopamine levels to drop. So people with low dopamine are at higher risk for addiction. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's definitely a risk factor. And remember that addiction is triggered by what we call the big three. Either genetics, which is your family history, and it's especially important, for example, in males when your father was an alcoholic, you're at a much great uh, increased risk of becoming an alcoholic yourself. Or trauma, and trauma doesn't have to be sexual assault. It can be emotional, physical, um, sexual, but trauma seems to trigger your brain and change it and make you more susceptible. And exposure. No one becomes an alcoholic until they drink. Now you may meet people in your life who you wish would drink, okay? And it may be that those people are walking around with low dopamine and they need to drink, okay? Because they are just miserable. And that's what we call a dry drunk. So let's talk about treatment. So what are we looking for when we talk about treatment? Because everybody has a different goal. And one thing that you will learn when you work with anybody who specializes in addiction is that we are um, very smug and self-centered and we know we have the answer and nobody else does. So one level of treatment is what we call harm reduction. And another level is abstinence and then a higher level um, which people just throw around is the word recovery. Okay, so what do these things mean? So harm reduction is where people often don't stop using. We just try and make it safer. So for example, we do needle exchange programs. We provide heroin. Um, different countries around the world are now providing injection sites. And in England, for example, you can get heroin with a prescription. Um, and the idea here is we want to reduce the harm caused by addiction, which is HIV, overdose, hepatitis C. And we really 
focus a lot on harm to society compared to harm to the patient. And we don't pretend we're curing the patient, we're essentially trying to keep the patient safe and alive. And then abstinence means lack of a drug. And that can be either the drug that you're addicted to or all drugs. I'm going to show you some studies tonight um, that claim a 50% success rate, but what they don't tell you is they're only looking at opiates. They're not looking at cocaine, benzos, or cannabis, or anything else. So you can argue that that's not really abstinence. And again, it applies to either just one drug, or you should be abstinent from all drugs. And when we talk about medication-assisted therapy in a couple of minutes, those studies all focused almost exclusively on opioids and nothing else. And finally, recovery. Everybody has their own definition of recovery, so eventually the big shots had to get together and write a paper on recovery. And this was a committee that met at the Betty Ford Institute, um, and they have a Betty Ford Institute consensus panel to tell you what your recovery is supposed to be. And they define it as abstinence, primarily from all drugs, physical, mental, and spiritual health, and this term is crazy, citizenship. They don't want to say spirituality, and so instead they call it citizenship. But it really means spirituality, which is believing there's something bigger than yourself and giving back to something else. And they also talk about quality of life. And for most people to be in recovery, their quality of life has to or will improve dramatically. So when we talk about these addiction studies, I'm going to warn you that there is a big, big mix. So the simplest study is an anecdote. Okay, so you may have heard of thalidomide, which was a drug that was given to pregnant moms, and the babies were born with missing limbs. And that was an incredibly rare outcome, and it became common in pregnant women who took this, so they found out that thalidomide causes phycomelia, missing limbs. Or there was a certain drug they used to give moms that caused cervical cancer in daughters who are only 10 years old. Another kind of study is observational. You don't ever even see the patient. You just go to the hospital, you pull the chart, and I look to see whether or not you smoke and whether or not you have an alcohol use disorder. So it looks at relationships, but it doesn't actually do anything. It's just an observational study. And then finally, there is an experimental study where we do something. We give you a medication, we give you a treatment, and we see what happens. And you can go farther than that. You can compare two different treatments, and that means we have to randomize you. And we can't just say the left half of the room gets drug A and the right half of the room gets drug B because that won't work. We have to match up all your characteristics, and that's a, that's a lot of work for a statistician. And you can have a control group, which means you, don't have a, you have a group that has no treatment at all. Now, one study I'm going to talk about complains that, or people complain that it was invalid because there was no control group, but you show me a cancer chemotherapy study that goes on nowadays that has a control group where patients are denied chemotherapy. They don't do that. They compare two different kinds of chemotherapy. So a lot of studies out there don't have a control group, but they compare two different treatments. And the best study should be blinded, meaning I don't know what I'm giving you and you don't know what you're getting. That may not be possible. For example, one drug makes your hair fall out and the other drug makes you throw up. So eventually you're going to figure out which one you're getting and I'm going to know which one I'm giving. And these are just different levels and if you put everything together, it's called a randomized, blinded, controlled uh, study, which is considered to be the gold standard in research. We don't have many of them. Or if you are sitting around and doing nothing, you can write for this organization called the Cochrane Database, and you can put a bunch of studies together, criticize all of them, say they're all no good, and write a paper on it. And that's called a meta-analysis. And I need to warn you that when you read about this, and these are called you know, expert witnesses or expert opinions, a lot of the people writing these papers are more concerned about picking apart the studies than whether or not they actually offer anything useful, so be careful. Okay, let's go back to complaining about addiction, saying it's not, doesn't really exist. If you want to meet, uh, I'm always trying to avoid politics, but if you want to meet the Donald Trump of addiction medicine, <laughs> it's uh, Stanton Peel, just look him up. And he will tell you that because he has been around a long time, he knows better than you do, and he knows that addiction is not a disease, it's just a phase of life. 
and he writes books. Um, he's, this is one of his books, The Truth About Addiction and Recovery. And of course, if you want to learn how to do it his way, you have to pay a small fee of several thousand dollars, and he'll let you in, be included into his courses. And there's another, um, this is not another book, Alcoholics Anonymous, Cult or Cure. And a lot of people spend a lot of time raving and ranting about Alcoholics Anonymous. It may happen here tonight. It frequently does. Um, but a lot of studies and programs are based upon fear or hatred of AA, which doesn't really seem like a, makes it much of a viable alternative. And the complaints about AA and treatment are that people just get better on their own. Okay? I don't think that really works anymore, in case you haven't noticed, it's opioid overdose is the major cause of death of anybody under 50 in the U.S., and we're going to lose somewhere between 70 and 80,000 lives this year. So people get better on their own when they overdose and die, but that's the kind of statements you'll see. So I want to give you an example that kind of puts it in perspective. As I used to uh, be a GYN cancer specialist, so let me give you an example dealing with cancer. Ovarian cancer is all over the news today, and you hear about people dying from ovarian cancer and new treatments, but when you look at it, only about one out of 100 women get ovarian cancer. It doesn't seem like much, right? And there are a lot more women who get ovarian tumors that turn out to be benign, and they have to go through surgery and get them removed and have complications only to find out that they don't have ovarian cancer. And those patients were harmed. You can say that this is a bad thing, saying we, we have to worry about ovarian cancer. And even when you diagnose ovarian cancer, the chance of curing it for life is low. Most patients live quite some time, but they're not cured for life. So because of all this, ovarian cancer is a fraud perpetrated by the medical establishment and should be abandoned. We shouldn't talk about it. Now, if I was to say this, you would properly label me as an idiot who should lose his medical license. But there are people saying this every day about addiction, even though we're losing thousands and thousands of people to opioid overdose and cocaine overdoses. Simply doesn't make sense, but that's what you're going to read out there. Okay, so let's go back to treatment. So how do you treat addiction? You can go on the wagon. You can stop. You can either say, I'm going on the wagon, or you maybe read your rights and you will stop. Okay, and it's been shown that this has a relapse rate that approaches 100%. Or you can do some type of psychosocial therapy. That can either be cognitive behavioral therapy, which you're going to be hearing about during this educational series, or mutual help meetings, which includes AA, NA. It also includes uh, something called smart recovery, which is more based on relapse prevention. You can have motivational enhancement, where you ask somebody, you know, on a scale of 0 to 10, how ready are you to stop? And you try and you take whatever number they give you and you try and move them up the scale until they actually stop using. Or you can have medication-assisted therapy, which we're going to spend more time talking about. But these are really the different techniques that are used. And again, you will hear the claim that people stop on their own. Um, that may happen a lot, but it still leaves a lot of people <coughs> untreated. We're also going to talk about, at the end, what we call the gold standard of addiction treatment. Anybody who's read Jason Schwartz's blog knows what that's going to be talking about. We'll come back to that. So you have different levels of addiction treatment also. You can have um, outpatient therapy where you go about once a week. And that is usually done after your primary therapy has already happened. Or you can have intensive outpatient, which really is about 10 hours of treatment a week, usually about three hours at a time. Or you may be using drugs that are unsafe to stop, and that's primarily alcohol and sedatives. And when you stop those, you can have a seizure, and that can be life-threatening. So in that case, we admit you someplace and detox you either with or without medication. Or if you need to be away from your environment for a while, you can go to long-term residential treatment, which really means 30 days or more, and programs may offer up to 90 days, and they used to offer 6 to 12 months. Or you may wind up being in a therapeutic community, which can be a three-quarter house um, where you live with sober people and start moving back into society by getting a job and finally move out of the transitional housing. 
or you can do medication assisted therapy in a methadone clinic or in a provider's office which is going to be either buprenorphine or naltrexone and we'll talk about both of those. So let's, we're going to talk about alcohol first and then opiates. So treatments for alcohol dependence. One is going to be mutual help meetings which is AA. And I'm going to show you some of the evidence which everyone will tell you doesn't exist. I'm going to show you the evidence that AA works very well. Or you can use what's called SMART recovery, um, which is based on relapse prevention uh, and has kind of the same principles as cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it is both in face to face and online. And if you're interested in it, you just have to Google SMART recovery. And here in Ann Arbor, we have meetings at the Ann Arbor Alano Club. I think they have them on Sundays. Or you can do CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, where you work with a therapist to try and identify the underlying reasons that you are using, whatever it is, and try and deal with those underlying beliefs. Or again, motivational enhancement therapy. I have to warn you that I'm one of the few people I know that took a motivational enhancement course and flunked it and was told not to bother coming back again because I, I don't think I have the necessary personality to encourage someone to move at their own pace, I guess. And there are a lot of programs you'll read about that are based upon, I hate AA, you need to hate AA, and oh, by the way, buy my book. Be very careful of those programs. And we've got medications that we're going to talk about. And this is the latest guru uh, to attack AA. This is Gabriel Glazer. She wrote an article in The Atlantic, I think it was last year or the year before. Didn't make much sense. Um, but what she did was she toured Europe and said, isn't America bad and don't you do it better? And they said, yeah, America's bad and we do it better. But what she talked about was only one therapy that we're going to cover briefly, which is called the Sinclair method um, using a medication. Um, and when you read about this, uh, she attacks uh, studies because there's no control group. Um, and if anybody's had advanced level statistics like high school, you know that you don't really need a control group to have a study that works. Also, if you go to the Cochrane database, they will tell you that there is no unequivocal evidence that AA works, which sounds like AA should be written off. But if you ask anybody, why did the Cochrane database say that? The Cochrane database does not believe in anything that is not a randomized, blinded, controlled trial, and you simply cannot do that with something like AA. You can't randomize somebody and tell them, well, you may be going to an AA meeting or you may be going shopping. You're not going to know. It simply doesn't work. So we're stuck with the level of evidence we have. If you're familiar with this, it's level, primarily level 2B evidence. Project MATCH is the biggest study ever done comparing treatments for alcohol. And they took a large number of patients and randomized them to AA. It wasn't exactly A, but it was 12-step facilitation explaining how to deal with AA. Motivational enhancement or CBT, there was no control group because that wasn't felt to be ethical. And they found that except for patients who were angry, who did better with motivational training, people tended to do better with AA. And they did this at five years, and they came back at 10 years and just repeated the evidence, and people were still doing better with AA. The problem was that most people had stopped going to AA, and those who stopped going to AA drank. So you wind up having a very small number at the end. And this is a fantastic uh, research scientist, Lisa Cascudis, who advertises herself as an atheist, but she has published a lot of research promoting AA. And again, this is not double-blind, randomized, controlled trials because we simply are not going to be doing that. But what she found, for example, was if you look at people who went to AA and didn't go to AA, on the left you have people at one year and a year and a half who went to AA. On the right you have people who didn't go to AA, and you can see the abstinence rate is cut in half when you don't go to AA. And yeah, you can argue, well, they didn't go to AA because they wanted to drink and AA didn't make any difference. Okay. Yeah. Or you can say that the number of meetings doesn't matter, but look at this study. This is a VA study. People either in a three-month period went to no meetings, less than 20, less than 50, or more than 50, and that was their abstinence percentage during that three-month period. Essentially, it's a straight line. So that's what we call a dose-response relationship. 
And again, you can look at meeting frequency um, right before people have been uh, out of treatment for two years. <clears throat> this is the abstinence rate if you never went to meetings, less than one a week or weekly or more, and it doubles the abstinence rate. Again, you can argue against each one of these studies, but study after study shows the relationship. We also have medications for alcohol dependence. Some of them work and some of them don't. Um, the one that I would not recommend people trying in most situations is disulfiram, which is antibutes. Remember when you were in high school and you dissected that frog and that horrible smell and it saturated your clothing and your hands? When you take antibutes, that turns alcohol into formaldehyde essentially in your blood and you get horribly, horribly sick. And the idea is that once you go through that, you decide never to go through that again, so you never drink again. In reality, you look up on the internet how to bypass this. I've had patients who painted their antabuse with nail polish. I've had patients who microwave their antabuse pills. And once you do that, um, the antabuse doesn't work. The next medication is naltrexone. This is kind of confusing because it comes in different versions. And you also have naloxone, which is Narcan. But naltrexone is a drug that blocks your opiate receptor. What does that have to do with alcohol? Because when you drink and you get that high feeling, that is mediated by your opioid receptors in your brain. It's the same pathway as using opioids. So if you block your opioid receptors, you don't enjoy drinking. And it's been shown to work with pills. It only works in research studies because if you take the pill and you're just deciding, well, you know, it's this is Super Bowl weekend. I'm not going to not drink, so I'll just stop taking my pills. And people stop and they never start again, so the pills by themselves really don't work. What does work is the shot. Vivitrol is an injection of monthly naltrexone and oil, and it's been shown to decrease drinking, both in terms of percent abstinent and heavy drinking days. And if you look at the study on that arrow you see on the right, it shows that people who got the high dose shot at six months, about 30% of them were abstinent. And you may think that 30% is not a good number, but in medicine, anything over 15% is considered to be successful. And the placebo group who didn't get any naltrexone, at six months, about 10% of them were abstinent. So they went from 10% abstinent to 30% abstinent, and again, in medicine, that is considered to be a successful result. Now, I want to warn you about one thing when you read these studies, and that's the placebo effect. This is kind of a confusing graph, but they looked at people in the study, and they said, how many days were you drinking heavily before the study started and after the study started, and which drug did you get? And the people that got enrolled in the study before it started were drinking heavily about 27 days per month. I don't know why they missed the other three days. I wouldn't, but the <laughs> average was 27 days. And then if they were enrolled in the study, but all they got was placebo, it dropped by half. It dropped down to 15, and there was no drug involved. That's the placebo effect that you will see in study after study involving psychotropic drugs. And then going down to the high dose, it went from 15 to 10, okay? But the biggest drop was going from 27 down to 15. That was nearly a 50% drop just by being in the study. And that's common over and over again. There's another drug called acamprosate or Camprol that works somehow to quiet the nerves in your brain that respond to a drug called NMDA. It's similar to almost like a benzodiazepine, but not as dangerous. And it works to reduce craving. And people who take it may have a dramatic decrease in craving. And remember that craving is one of what we call the four C's. What they did was they looked at a camprosate, naltrexone, cognitive behavioral therapy, and placebo medication, and they combined them all together and called it the combined trial. And they mixed it up every different way possible. And they knew that they were going to get dramatic results, but here's what they got. The only people, the people who did best, were patients who were getting either naltrexone and counseling, or those getting a pill, placebo pill and counseling. So even getting the placebo pill made a big difference. That's the placebo effect. And then all the different combinations otherwise didn't really matter. So what it came down to was the people who got better 
were the ones that were taking a pill. Unfortunately, a lot of the pills were placebo. It wasn't really a very dramatic outcome for the study. Now, you may have heard of this one. This is the Sinclair method. Dr. David Sinclair has passed away, but he worked in Europe for about 20 years, and he had a method that was based on what we call extinction, meaning if I do something that was rewarding, and all of a sudden it's not rewarding, eventually I'm going to stop doing it. Okay? And what he did was he had people take naltrexone before they drank, but they didn't stop drinking. And they found that if they didn't enjoy it, then the reward would go down and their craving would go down. It's not a fast result. It takes months. And also, it means that you have to keep drinking. And I'll meet patients who only want to talk about the Sinclair method, and when I talk to them, it's pretty obvious that the reason they want to do a Sinclair method is so they can tell their spouse that they have to keep drinking. So that's not always the best solution for people. So um, this is what, if you read that article by Gabriel Glazer, um, this is what she talks about, the Sinclair method, which doesn't really need a treatment center at all, but that's beyond this article. But there's only three doctors in Michigan that offer the Sinclair method. I'm one of them, um, and I'd be glad to talk to you about it if you think you have an alcohol problem. But it means that you have to keep drinking, and if that's your reason to do that method, it's probably not going to work too well. This is what Dr. Sinclair claims. And these studies are older, and they're not being done in the US. But this is your craving score over a period of three months. And it drops dramatically from five down to about two. Again, remember that craving is one of the reasons for relapse. Next drug is baclofen. Baclofen is a medication that's used for spinal cord injuries. It works like a benzodiazepine, but it works on a different part of your brain, and there is no treatment for addiction for it. If you're taking too much of this, we can't give you something else. We have to keep giving you this. If you stop taking it, you can seize. And a lot of patients who are alcoholic started taking huge doses of this because there was a book written that this is a cure for alcoholism. And they stopped drinking, but they couldn't stop taking baclofen. And we've had patients at Don Farm who came in addicted to this, and the only thing we could do was to slowly taper them off it, which is truly miserable because it takes weeks. And again, this is more, even more dangerous than benzos in a way because there is no treatment for it if we take you off it. Okay, did I mention this was depressing? All right, let's move on to opioid dependence, treatment of opioid dependence. And when you talk about opioid dependence, you need to realize there's two different classes of drugs. There's agonists and antagonists. Agonists do the same thing as the drug that you're trying to get rid of. So for example, you'll take methadone or buprenorphine instead of heroin. Antagonists have the opposite effect. And for example, you would take naltrexone to block heroin, and that's an antagonist. We don't use antagonists for pregnant patients, otherwise, Either of these drugs can be used for almost anybody. And if you look this stuff up on the internet, you will definitely see this slide. And I've been trying to teach this slide for years, and I finally just gave up. Okay? Even when I you know, talk to a bunch of docs who do this for a living, they get confused with this. So here's what I made up for them. There are three levels of agonists and antagonists. There is the full agonist, and the best example of that is methadone. Methadone gives you the most bang for your buck. It relieves withdrawal, pain, and it kills you by overdosing you. So it's a full opioid agonist. So it's like putting Sunoco 260 in your tank, those of you who ever used to do that. The rest of us are too cheap, so we put in 87 octane, and that's buprenorphine. Buprenorphine gives you less bang for your buck, so it causes less pain relief, less withdrawal control, but it's also much safer People don't overdose on buprenorphine unless they're mixing something else with it. And then finally, you know if you put water in the tank, it stops working, and that's naltrexone. It blocks the effects of opioid, and that means the engine won't run, and the, your brain is blocked from being exposed to any opioids. So methadone. Methadone is the oldest treatment in the US for opioid dependence. It was made legal in 1965. We started using it here in Detroit for pregnant patients in 1969. And this is a methadone clinic in northern Minnesota. And this is a methadone clinic where I used to live in East Africa. 
They look the same. People come every day, they get their methadone dose, and they go home. So one feature of methadone clinics is that you have to go every day, and because of that, people see you every day and make sure you're okay. The other problem is that you have to get out of the methadone clinic and make it through the parking lot, and that's where everybody's selling drugs. So there's a stigma with methadone clinics, and a lot of it is well-deserved. There's a lot of crime that goes on, and I've worked at a methadone clinic for 10 years. We've treated a lot of people, but there's a lot of nonsense going on. So methadone clinic, again, has a pretty well-proven track record. Your mortality goes down, IV drug use, crime, HIV, hepatitis C, relapsed injection, and you get your life back, okay? You don't necessarily stop using. You may switch over to a benzo, and you've got a prescription for your benzos, or you decide to start taking Adderall. But IV drug use definitely drops. The problem with methadone is it builds up very slowly in your body. If you go to a methadone clinic and get a doctor who doesn't know what they're doing, and you con them into giving you more methadone, it can kill you seven days out. Because this is the same dose of methadone building up over three days, and you can see that the levels are getting higher and higher, and they can become dangerous after a few days. There are still 1,000 deaths a year from methadone clinics in the U.S. It's still a very high number. This is a huge study done in New York at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, and this is back when uh, we didn't have any real treatments. I was working at Wayne State at the time, and they took all the methadone clinics they could in New York City, and they looked to see what happened when these patients who were using IV drugs got into the methadone clinic. And over a five-year period, there was a 70% drop in IV drug use. That is huge, because back then, that was the main method of HIV transmission, and that's all we could do. But remember those broken brains that I showed you? These folks decided, well, I'm clean. It's time for me to come off the methadone, go back to work. I'm tired of coming here. And what happened was, within 12 months, 80% of them were back using IV drugs. <coughs> so the relapse rates are, are not good. And people in methadone clinics tend to use cocaine, marijuana, amphetamines. They drink. Um, it is difficult to get into clinics in some part of the state. There's a lot of crime going on, and it's not popular with the legal system, especially with moms who have had kids. The judges will try and force them off methadone. One danger is methadone pills. Methadone pills are a fraction of the prescriptions, but up to 30% of prescription pill deaths. So it's something that you need to be very careful of. If one of your loved ones is going to a pain doc, and getting methadone pills, be very, very afraid. Because if that doctor doesn't know how to prescribe methadone, it can easily be lethal. We have 4,000 deaths a year from methadone tablets in the US. That's a lot. Next drug is buprenorphine. We call it Suboxone, Subutex, Zubsolve. It's all the same thing. It's a partial agonist, so it's safer. And they say it's four times safer but it's probably more like 100 times safer than methadone. And just to spare you the agony of going through these studies, here's one real life study from a Suboxone clinic out on the East Coast. At 24 months, two years, 40% of the patients were still in the clinic and still doing well. But people don't stop using other drugs. The studies that we're gonna talk about only look at opiates. So they keep on taking benzos, amphetamines, cannabis, alcohol. So when you say, when you talk about recovery, this doesn't really fit the picture. When people stop taking buprenorphine, they almost all relapse, almost every single person. It's a very rough drug to come off of. And the 12-step community um, looks down on you. For example, if you go to an NA meeting and talk to somebody, they will tell you if you take Suboxone or Zubsolve, you are not clean. You're free to come, but you're still using, which is hard to handle. And basically, what do the big wigs say? Methadone is more dangerous, but people stay in treatment longer if they stay on methadone. Okay, drug number three, Vivitrol. Vivitrol is the injectable form of naltrexone, and once you get it, you are stuck with it, literally, for four weeks because it's an oil, and you get an injection, and you can't do anything about it. And they decided to do this study in, in Russia. This is addiction treatment in Russia. 
This is a true, uh, this is actual picture. You come into one of these treatment centers, they handcuff you to a bed, you go through withdrawal, which consists of vomiting and diarrhea, and that's why the guy in the bottom bunk looks so nervous. And then after two weeks, um, this is serious, they unhandcuff you and you go out and most folks will use in the alley right outside the treatment center. They don't allow medications. So this was one of the best places to try out a study because there was nothing else there. This is the worst picture. This is a real picture. This is a drug called crocodile, also known as desomorphine. It is made from codeine and industrial solvents. Unfortunately, the industrial solvents are still in it, so when you inject it into your body, whatever area you inject it into will dissolve. And this is someone's face. Her face is gone. You're looking at her skull, um, and she is probably still using. Most people don't stop. And again, this is how bad addiction is in Russia. So here's what they found. They took people, they took a couple hundred, 250, and they randomized them to a dummy shot or a Vivitrol counseling, housing, and they watched them for six months. At the end of the six months, the ones on Vivitrol were about 55% abstinent. The ones on placebo were about 35% abstinent, and that difference got FDA approval. That is a significant difference, but again, most of it is due to placebo effect or counseling or housing, whatever you want to say. But there is a difference between Vivitrol and placebo and you do have a better chance. It's now FDA approved for this. And again, why is this gentleman handcuffed? It's not because of withdrawal. He doesn't have to worry about it. The guy in the bottom does. But what it's because of is craving. Craving is the reason that you relapse, okay? And this is a slide I thought I was throwing in. You can always think of addiction as being due to the four C's. When you don't have it, you crave it. You have to use it to feel normal, that's compulsion. You lose control of it. So remember whoever wrote that commercial about I bet you can't eat just one, they understood addiction. And you use despite consequences, so despite loss of my career, my family, my friends, everything, I can't stop using. There are big problems with Vivitrol because you have to be off short-acting opioids for a week or long-acting opioids for two weeks. Tell somebody who's actively using heroin to stop using today and come back in a week. It just won't happen. So the studies that were done comparing all these drugs, they put everybody inpatient and then they randomized them to buprenorphine or Vivitrol and everybody got kept during the induction phase. In real life, that doesn't happen. So if you got started on Vivitrol, it worked as well as Suboxone or Zubsolve. But the problem was getting you started. And in real life, all the patients that I have had on Vivitrol either came from detox, residential treatment, or the jail system. We have a lot of people who uh, are released from jail and given a Vivitrol shot on the way out. I've also had some disasters. I had one patient who was a, she had a one-year-old. She violated probation. She went into jail for 30 days. She was being released on Saturday night, which is a bad thing to do. I was supposed to give her a Vivitrol shot on Monday morning. Her husband found her dead on Sunday morning. She only lived eight hours after being discharged. She went out and she used and she didn't realize that she was no longer tolerant to heroin and she bought her normal amount and it killed her. So I have never, I've been doing this since 2002, I have never once had a patient on the day they started medication ask me when they could get off their medication. It's a universal thing because people don't want to be on medication. They don't want to keep taking methadone or Suboxone or Zubsolve or Vivitrol. So how well are people doing at getting off this? This is one study from England. This is Dr. Jason Ludi. Dr. Ludi believes that methadone is evil. Nobody should be on it, especially pregnant patients. So he designed a study where he found 101 opiate addicted women who were pregnant and he tried to <coughs> detox them. He succeeded with 40 patients. That's great. Okay, that's a very remarkable study. And then he said, okay, you're cured, you're free, I'll see you at delivery. At delivery, only one patient had a negative drug screen. Everybody else had either disappeared or relapsed. And that's a natural history of untreated addiction. This is the most famous study you're going to see on 
relapse. This is Dr. Keiko's study from Sweden. They took 40 active heroin addicts and they put them on <laughs> buprenorphine and they detoxed them and then half of them were allowed to go on their way, which is what all my patients want to do, and half of them stayed on the buprenorphine for a year and they came back to see how things went. A year later, the people who stayed on the buprenorphine, 75 percent were abstinent and no one had died. The ones who tapered off the buprenorphine, nobody was abstinent and 20 percent were dead. So detoxing somebody and saying that is adequate doesn't work. Now I'm just going to blow through this quickly because this was the biggest study ever done and you still read about this in the news. They took 650 patients and put them on buprenorphine for two weeks. These were almost all prescription pill addicts. And then they tapered them off and said, okay, let's see how you do. Didn't go well. Everybody relapsed. So they said, okay, let's try again. They put them back on buprenorphine. About 50% stayed abstinent, which was the same as the first one. And then they tapered them off again and everybody relapsed. Twice, okay? So the moral is that this medication works about half the time, which is good, but um, it doesn't work when you stop taking it, which really is no surprise. So for buprenorphine, it works. The one bad thing was that heroin, people addicted to heroin did not do well. They had a much lower success rate and when you come off it, it stops working. And they have recommended that we stop talking about medication assisted treatment and just call it medication treatment because it seems to be doing most of the work. Don't really know whether or not that's true. So it works when you relapse, it stops working and you may die. And methadone, buprenorphine and Vivitrol all have about the same success rate and the same failure rate when you stop it. Okay, how about no medications? There is a lot of this on alcohol. For opioids there is very, very little. And 12-step and CBT, et cetera, et cetera, don't show a lot of effect when you talk about treating opioid dependence. <coughs> and there are not a lot of studies. One, I just put in one reference um, from studies done in Europe where they did show good outcomes, but you really don't have any studies here from the U.S. So, are there any exceptions? And the answer is yes. And this applies to what we call the safety-sensitive professions, the ones that are responsible to the public. Airline pilots, law enforcement, judges, and healthcare professionals. And they all have programs across the country that monitor them if they have addiction and their success rates are much, much higher than anything else we've talked about today. And in, when you talk about treating doctors or nurses or pharmacists, we tend to all call them physician health programs or healthcare programs. In Michigan, it's called the HPRP. And the success rate is 80 to 90 percent compared to everything else we've talked about. Opioid addicts did just as well as alcoholics and most of these studies did not use medications. It's a very, very strong outcome. The FAA has their own program for pilots. Um, we have programs for docs, um, nurses, pharmacists, and every state has their own program. And they're all based on careful monitoring which is often called negative reinforcement, which means that if something happens and you relapse, we're going to reach out, we're going to take you off work, we're going to send you back for an evaluation, and if you need, we're going to send you for more treatment. And that compare that to probation, which is where you screw up, screw up, and then go back in. So it doesn't really help deter or help promote recovery. And I'm going to give you a sarcastic view of what people say about healthcare professional programs. It says they work because doctors have more to lose. So my specialty is actually OB-GYN. I work with pregnant moms who have addiction and they risk losing their child, the children they already have, and all the children they're going to have. Michigan has really rough laws. I can't think of anybody who has more to lose than a pregnant mom. So this is nonsense. They work because doctors are smarter. I've been teaching medical school since 1990. This statement is not operative. <laughs> they work because doctors can afford treatment. That may be true if you get to somebody before they've lost everything, but a lot of the docs I meet um, have lost their jobs. 
They have three different lawyers. Their spouse has all the money. They're homeless. And we have had health care professionals who completed our program while living at the Salvation Army. You don't have to have a lot of money. And finally, they work because doctors get special treatment. That's true, but not how this phrase means. It works because we expect more out of pilots, lawyers, law enforcement, and health care, and we hold them to a higher standard, and we watch them closer. And again, we have an 80-plus percent <coughs> success rate without usually using medication therapy. Now, last one is, do you have to be one of these folks to succeed? Is the program only for them? And the answer is no. This is called the HOPE program, Hawaii Opportunity for Probation Enforcement. It's methamphetamine addicted felons. These folks have been through the ringer. And most of them do not have a high <coughs> level of education. And what they did was they looked at the typical failure rates with a regular probation program. And the failure rates are about 50% at least. And then they created a program that's almost identical to the healthcare programs we have in the US. And their success rates are the same as they are for doctors and pilots. And it's been reproduced uh, in uh, Washington State. And if you think about the drug courts we have around here, they use the same principles and they have extremely high success rates. Okay, a little bit about Narcan. And this is, um, I first did this for Families Against <laughs> Narcotics. And people always get these two drugs mixed up, naltrexone and naloxone. We've been talking about naltrexone. It's long acting and it's used to prevent you from overdosing. Naloxone is short acting and it's used to reverse an overdose. And it's not used for treatment and it's only given in an emergency situation. And it does not work for anything except opioids. So if your loved one or whoever you find has overdosed on multiple drugs, the only thing it's going to reverse is the opioid. But that may be enough in, to get the patient to the hospital. People tend to overdose after they get rescued. The mortality rate in one year after being resuscitated with Narcan is at least 10%. That's high. It's very, very high. So people go out and do it again. And everybody has met people, and I have a lot of patients who have OD'd two or three times in the same day. Everybody in the world used that dose for Narcan for about 30 years. It's 0.4 milligrams. And that was all you needed to reverse heroin. Because of the fentanyl crisis, we are now using 4 milligrams. And when you pick up a pack of this, and by the way, you can just go to a pharmacy and buy it now. You don't need a prescription. You don't have to be the patient. You can have a loved one who's in trouble. You can just go and get a pack of this. It's called the ADAPT spray. And there's two of them in a pack. And the one on the top right actually talks to you when you inject it if in case you, you know, you've never used needles and you don't know what to do. And on the bottom right is our therapy dog, Olive. <laughs> who overdoses? People who have stopped. People who went to treatment, who went to jail. People who stopped their buprenorphine, their methadone. And people who are exposed to fentanyl. The huge increase in death that we're seeing is not due to heroin, it's due to fentanyl. And it's not due to prescription pills anymore either. This is the major problem. And what you want to do is make sure someone has really overdosed. And this is the hard part. Before you save them, call 911. Why? Because after you save them, you're going to forget. And you're going to wonder why they haven't shown up. And then you're going to realize, oh my god, I never called them. So call 911, put it on speakerphone, put the phone down, and then resuscitate them. And rescue breaths, as you have heard, are now considered to be potentially dangerous because you may be exposed to fentanyl. And on the news tonight, they just had an overdose of a law enforcement or a first responder that required three doses of Narcan to keep them alive long enough to get them to the hospital. I would not want to be the guy they arrested. And people who have overdosed are not sleeping. They are not breathing. They are blue or they are gurgling. And their fingertips, their lips are blue. And they may have a pulse. Don't think you're out of the woods if somebody has a pulse. Because what you want to do is you want to stop. You want to resuscitate them before their heart stops. That's the last thing that's going to happen. 
and you can try and resuscitate them by doing something painful. You can twitch their ear, you can do a sternal rub, you can squeeze their fingernails, and if they wake up and then go back out, you have an overdose on your hands. You need to give them Narcan. And remember, call 911 first. And if you're going to give rescue breaths, you give them a second or two apart. You just give one second breath. Don't breathe in hard because you can rupture their lungs. And their chest should move, but their abdomen should not move. And again, this is felt to be dangerous <coughs> now for you because you may be exposed to the fentanyl. If you have a loved one who you think may get in trouble, or at our treatment centers and our detox units, we have these rescue masks. They're one-way valves, so you can blow in, but they can't blow out. So it's, it will make it much safer to do rescue breathing. And now, once someone has been resuscitated, you have what we call a window of opportunity. This is one of Jason Swartz's blogs. This is where you can try and talk someone into going to treatment. Unfortunately, most people are not interested. They just want to get the hell out of there. But some people may say, okay, I've had enough. I'll go to treatment. And what we're doing now in different emergency departments is we have recovery coaches that will come to the hospital, meet with somebody who is overdosed, and try and get them in. And we also have a program called Hope Not Handcuffs, where people who are arrested will be offered treatment, or people can go to a police station and say, I want help. And unless they have a felony charge, that kind of ruins the game. Unless you have a felony charge, you'll be referred to treatment instead of being arrested. And here's Families Against Narcotics. Again, we have two organizations now who are neighbors. We have Washtenaw County and Western Wayne County that meets in Canton. Um, I'd encourage you, um, you probably have someone in your life with an addiction problem if you're here, either yourself or somebody else, to think about going to one of these meetings. You can find them online. There's always somebody who wants to spoil the fun. This is a paper who, that came out a couple months ago that said we should not give Narcan because all they're going to do is survive and rob you. That's exactly what they recommended. And this caused a, I'll use the word, firestorm um, on the internet. This has not been published in what we call a peer review paper. These are two researchers who put this together. But they used data from the CDC, so it's kind of hard just to ignore this. And they say that things actually get worse when you save somebody, and you should possibly just let nature take its course. OK, we're going to finish with alternative treatments, because somebody wanted me to mention these drugs. And we're going to talk about cannabis, kratom, and ibogaine. So cannabis, does cannabis make it safer to use opioids, or does it prevent people from becoming addicted? One of the biggest studies in the world came right out of Ann Arbor. It's Dr. Benke, they went to the medical marijuana clinic over on State Street. I met the medical director, and they looked at their chronic pain patients at U of M, and they claimed that there was a 64% drop in opioid use when these folks went to the medical marijuana clinic, and their quality of life went up. That's a completely uncontrolled, unrandomized study. It's a chart review, but it definitely needs to be investigated, and they're trying to repeat the study. And two other studies showed pretty much the same thing. This is the biggest one in the, that you'll see in the country. People quote this on TV all the time. This is Dr. Bach Huber from 2014. And what they found was if you look at states that don't have medical marijuana laws and states that do have medical marijuana laws, the mortality is lower, 24% lower, in states that have medical marijuana laws. And if that's true, that's obviously a big deal. The problem was the study ended in 2010, and if you look at those lines, they are approaching each other rapidly. And this study was not extended. A different study done by the Rand Corporation claimed that it's not the medical marijuana laws, it's having a medical marijuana dispensary that lowers overdose deaths. So again, this needs to be investigated. And another study that was based on I don't know, I'm sure you've all heard of this, the National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions looked at thousands and thousands of patients across the U.S. and they found that patients who use medical marijuana wound up using more opioids, 
not less. So it was the exact opposite finding. So there is no conclusion about cannabis. Is marijuana harmful? The gentleman, the medical director who ran the clinic over on State Street, uh, the night I heard him talk, he got up and he said, marijuana is safer than coffee. Okay, so does it cause problems? Um, there is cannabis addiction. It's about 50, 10 to 15% of people that use it. If you're an adolescent and you become addicted to cannabis, you may very well have an IQ drop that is irreversible. This is not a harmless drug. Patients who use, while they're pregnant, who use cannabis, they have a bigger chance of losing their baby, having a small baby, or having a stillborn. So it's not a harmless medication. And this is a study in New Zealand that found that if you uh, used cannabis, you would have an IQ drop that was irreversible. As marijuana a gateway drug? People say that if you use cannabis, you're more likely to move over to bigger drugs, more dangerous drugs. There are studies to support that. There are also studies to refute that. And this is um, one of the more verbal bloggers you will see on the internet. This is Maya Solovitz, Solovitz, and she says that she has proved that cannabis is not a gateway drug and cannabis will save lives um, by decreasing opioid use. And her evidence is pretty much what we talked about before. Again, there's really no conclusion on this. Does medical marijuana, does marijuana increase motor vehicle accidents? The answer is yes. Now, how about adolescents? We always worry about kids. Does medical marijuana increase adolescent use? This is a huge paper, and this person is a big shot. Deborah Hassin, she wrote, if you're familiar with it, she wrote the DSM-5. So this is a heavy hitter. This paper said that adolescent use does not increase on the average in the U.S. with medical marijuana laws. But when you actually tease the paper apart, the lines on the left are states who had less cannabis use in adolescence. The lines on the right are states that had more. Guess what state is at the bottom with the most increase? Mm -hmm. Michigan. Michigan had a 77% increase in adolescent cannabis use when the medical marijuana laws were passed. No matter how you look at it, that's significant. But if you look at the entire country, the average was no, no increase. Kratom. Um, Kratom is a well-controlled herbal drug from the jungles of Thailand. I'm sure they have good quality control over there. And it is um, an herb that acts as an opioid. It's been classified as an opioid by the FDA and I have countless patients who get off medications, get off opioids, they get off Suboxone, and then they read about how harmless Kratom is and how it helps you, and they become addicted to Kratom. I have pregnant patients who are addicted to Kratom, patients who have gotten off all medications and are now addicted <laughs> to Kratom, and the FDA has put out a warning, and it will probably be a controlled substance soon. They made it a controlled substance once, and there was such an outcry that the DEA backed off, but it's probably going to happen again. If you use this, you are using an opioid, and you will become tolerant, and you will become dependent. It will happen in about two weeks. So you have to realize that even though you can get it at the local Sunoco, um, it may, may not be the safest drug. And finally, Ibogaine, how many people have heard of this? Okay. Ibogaine is what we call an indole alkaloid, which means a psychedelic. And the theory is that it shakes you up so badly that if you survive, and the, the mortality rate is not high, it's less than 10%, but if you survive using the Ibogaine, then your cravings and your withdrawal is gone. And depending on who you believe, you just have to use it once, or you have to use it every week, but the FDA was using, doing experimentation on it, and they had some deaths of people using it, um, and they stopped, and now they're saying the research will begin. But if you look on the internet, it is a harmless drug that will cure you in one treatment. I would urge you to um, think about this very hard if you're planning on going to the Caribbean or going to Africa to take this treatment. There's a significant mortality rate. Okay, so anybody here not fed up? All right, so 
This is what happened to uh, three of my colleagues in one year outside our methadone clinic over on Jefferson Avenue. <laughs> and this gets frustrating. And Dr. Tom McClellan, who for a short time was the drug czar of the U.S., wrote a paper on this. And he said that the success rate for addiction treatment, if it was done well, was about 40%. And that's the same number we've been talking about all night. And there's a lot of reasons why people relapse, but most people will relapse. And because of that, we always thought of addiction as being hopeless. And what he did was he said, okay, what about all the other chronic illnesses that we treat? Hypertension, diabetes, asthma, what's their success rate? Surprise, their success rate is 40 to 50%. And when people stop their treatments, they relapse, okay? The difference is they don't commit crimes when they stop their treatments. And that's why we get all the stigma about addiction. So if you were my patient and you were diabetic and you stopped taking your insulin, um, you would go into a coma and I would come to see you in the ICU and I would say, you idiot, you almost died, here's your insulin prescription, come back and see me next week. But if you were one of my addiction patients and you stopped your buprenorphine, your methadone, your 12 steps, and you wound up in the ICU, I would come and see you and i start shouting at you and I would say, you're an addict, you're hopeless, you're fired. Okay? And we all do that, and I have done this. And this is because of the stigma and because of all the frustration you get when people relapse um, they do bad things. And it's something that kind of colors the entire picture, but addiction should be listed along with all these other chronic illnesses that we can't cure, but we can treat. And here's again, here's our, this is my wife Kathy, who's our nurse practitioner in our practice that just closed. And here's our therapy dog. And here's our other therapy dog. He's no longer with us, but this was Stan the man who was our resident ladies man in the office. So <laughs> here's my contact information and um, thanks for listening and if there's any questions we can answer them. The question is why are there so many different names for a drug? Um, because everyone's selling their own version. So buprenorphine is four different names, but it's essentially the same medication. The question was, what about gabapentin? Gabapentin is used often for um, short-term treatment of alcohol, and we didn't talk about benzodiazepine dependence, um, but if you don't taper somebody off it, they're gonna be dependent on gabapentin, and gabapentin is now a controlled substance, so people are gonna stop prescribing it. The question is, why can't you take Vivitrol when you're pregnant? Um, I have had patients who got pregnant on Vivitrol, and I've offered to treat them during most of their pregnancy, but towards the end, I recommended switching to the pill form, because if you were to need an emergency C-section, or you know, have a complication during delivery, it's almost impossible to give you pain medication. And that's, the, that's really the, the main reason. The question is, how can we model the pilots and physicians program for somebody who has addiction? And the answer is places are trying. Um, Brighton Hospital has an extended care program, which kind of has the same model. Um, Don Farm has a similar program. But the problem is that um, these programs involve leverage, meaning that if you don't comply, something's going to happen. And you can't do that with a patient um, because if they, if, you, if they violate the agreement, they're just going to walk away. You can't do that if you're enrolled in the pilot's program. So the question was, does a concussion contribute to low dopamine? Patients who have had traumatic brain injuries are at increased risk for addiction. I don't know whether dopamine has anything to do with that though, but they are at increased risk once they've had a traumatic brain injury. So the question is, how long does it take to heal up? Um, I didn't show the slides, but there's one study with methamphetamine showing that the recovery appears to happen in about a year and a half. So when people get two years, um, I say, you know, congratulations, you've gotten everything back, and I say the bad news is you never had everything in the first place. So that's usually not well received, but that's pretty much how it is. So the question is the question, are they in recovery? 
it really is an individual definition. If you believe Narcotics Anonymous, they are not clean. I have patients on buprenorphine, for example, who have a stronger recovery program than I do. Um, I have patients who have been on methadone for 10, 15 years, and they have gotten their lives back. Um, it depends how you define it. If you say that you must be drug free, I don't know where that comes from, but if someone has that definition, then you would say that somebody on MAT is not clean. Well, they have to ask the patient. I mean, I, I, I recommend to patients that they do whatever it is to get out of the life they've gotten caught up in. So the question is, does an overdose cause a permanent memory loss? And the answer is it depends on what happened. I have patients who have had permanent brain damage from an extended overdose. People who are brought back within minutes usually recover everything. So the question is, um, does Narcan bad because it makes them feel invincible? I've heard that. I've never met anybody who felt that way. People who have been through a Narcan reversal don't speak highly of it. <laughs> so, yeah. so the question is, if someone is a long-term alcoholic who has seizures when they stop drinking, how is the best way to treat it? You need to go inpatient somewhere. You have to go inpatient. It may or may not involve Medication um, involves being monitored to see if your withdrawal is getting bad enough where you have to go to the hospital or have to be given medication. But if you've seized when you've stopped, you will seize again when you stop again. Well, they need to be in an environment where they can be monitored carefully enough. Okay, so thanks everybody. I'll stick around for any other questions afterwards.